for, make no mistake, Florida is crucial, Senator Lori Wilson and the Equal Rights Amendment, uh, talk being presented by Dr. Kimberly Voss from the Nicholson School of Communication. Well, housekeeping for this presentation is we ask that you keep your microphones muted and your cameras off during the presentation. If you have a question you would like to ask of Dr. Voss, please put it, post it into the chat and I will address it to her once she's finished the presentation. And Dr. Voss is you know, one of our favorite speakers. She's done presentations for us multiple times for Women's History Month. She's a full professor of journalism with the UCF Nichols Console Communication. Her research interests include women and media, journalism, history, and social media. She recently finished her latest book, Newspaper Fashion Editors and the Rise of the Fashion Industry in the 1950s and 60s, Women Writers on the, um, women writers on the Runway, She's currently working on a book about Dallas Women's Page editor Vivian Castleberry, as well as an oral history project with retired newspaper food editors. Dr. Voss, would you like to get started? Yes, please. So I'm so happy to be able to speak about Lori Wilson and the Equal Rights Amendment um, with you today. I love women's history, and so Women's History Month in March is my favorite time of the year. Um, but what I think is especially important about the ERA and Lori Wilson is how important it still is today. We still don't have an Equal Rights Amendment, and when we get to the end, I'll talk a little bit more about that, um, because it, it really is something that's continued to be debated. Um, and I think at a bare minimum, we need to think about women's rights in the Constitution um, now more than ever. And so I think the ERA helps us with that. I'm guessing if you're from Florida and you're watching this, you're familiar with Lori Wilson because of her park um, over uh, in the Cocoa Beach area. And she was so significant um, when she was in the Florida Senate uh, in the 1970s, but she really became very much a, a private citizen after that. And so the role that she played in the Equal Rights Amendment nationally and in Florida is often overlooked. So I'm very happy to be able to talk about her today. So if you aren't familiar um, with the Equal Rights Amendment, I wanted to make sure that uh, I at least put this up today. It doesn't seem very radical. Um, if you look at it, the quality of rights under the law, um, Congress will have the power, um, this amendment shall take effect two years. None of this seems that radical, but at the time, um, when we talk about the late 60s into the 1970s, it really was considered um, a very controversial um, matter in which side you were on. It was a great idea, a horrible idea. But this idea of equality of rights is something that, again, um, hasn't gone away. We still discuss these things. Um, when we talk about gender rights, it sometimes feels um, odd, I think sometimes in the last few decades, but to think about what women did or didn't have in the 1960s and 1970s, which was kind of the height of what I'm gonna talk about today. Um, married women couldn't have their own credit cards. They could not sign a mortgage or a lease. Um, in Florida, they couldn't sit on juries in the 1960s. Um, and so there was, this idea of equality um, was incredibly important. Um, some of it was silly, as we'll talk about, uh, and some of the fights about it. But this is still something that is important. Some legal scholars have said that the 14th Amendment gives women rights. Uh, in other words, we don't need an ERA because of the 14th Amendment. But um, other legal scholars um, and uh, the late Supreme Court Justice um, Anton Scalia also said that the 14th Amendment doesn't give women equal rights. It's probably the only thing that he and I agree on, um, but it, it's why we still need to kind of talk about that. Um, section two here, Congress will have the power. Part of the question there um, have to do with the federal government versus states' rights. And I think, you know, um, we've seen so much of that when we talk about um, say the virus or uh, closing schools or wearing masks, is this kind of dynamic between what the federal government says we should do and what states say we could, should do or could do. Um, the third part is in some ways the most significant to talk about the ERA 
so here, this amendment shall take effect two years after the date of ratification. And of course, this goes back decades now. And many legal scholars have said because of changes to the constitution um, in the eighties, that section three um, doesn't really have the staying power. In other words, we could still do something about that at this point. It's hard, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, to talk about the ERA in Florida without talking about uh, Lori Wilson. Uh, if you can tell from this uh, picture, she was um, quite attractive. And that made her um, significant in terms of media coverage because many have compared her to kind of Gloria Steinem in that she could be for the ERA, which was considered kind of anti-feminine, um, but also be very camera ready. Uh, one of the things I loved about Lori is that she always wore a white suit, um, going back to the suffragettes of uh, previous years. Um, so she would wear this white suit when she went throughout the, uh, the state of Florida to talk about the significance of the Equal Rights Amendment because she was the main sponsor. Um, just to give you a little bit of background about Lori, uh, Governor Kirk in 1969, appointed Wilson to fill a vacancy on the Brevard County Commission. She was the first woman in the state to receive this kind of gubernatorial uh, appointment. She was then elected to a full term on the commission in 1970. She was elected commission chair in 72, the first woman uh, in our state to have that position. In November of 1972, she was elected to the Florida Senate. She was just the third woman in our state to be elected to that position and the very first independent to serve in the legislature's upper house. Uh, she was reelected in uh, 1974 and served until 1978. Um, at this point, um, she did not have any political experience other than some volunteer work. Um, she had moved to Florida um, from the Carolinas when she got married. Uh, and she had two young children. She later um, was a divorcee, which was kind of a big deal at the time that a, a woman would run for office um, with that as knowledge. So again, just some background from Florida ERA. Uh, the proposal uh, was before the Florida Senate for the first time in 74. It failed by a vote of 21 to 19. Um, the action in the House failed uh, by 64 to 54. Tried again in 77 and it failed again. Now, at this point, um, we needed um, a certain number of states to be approved. And so Florida was considered significant, which goes back to the title of my talk, um, was that if Florida would pass this legislation, the rest of the other states in the South would. Um, and it was, they overestimated and underestimated Florida in many ways. Um, so what I looked at, um, that I'm talking about today, I looked at the Miami Herald's coverage of the Equal Rights Amendment in the 1970s. At that point in time, the Miami Herald was a statewide newspaper. I also looked at the raw data from the New Directions for News study, um, what was housed at the University of uh, Missouri. And so what they did in the New Direction for News in the 1980s was look back at um, all the coverage of the ERA from across the country. And so I looked specifically at what Florida newspapers and some national um, media outlets had to say about Florida and the ERA. I also looked at uh, television news clips from the, the Vanderbilt uh, University Television Archive, as well as the Tallahassee Democrat, um, just to be able to give some kind of comparison that I'll talk to you about. So some more brief background. Um, the, liber the Women's Liberation Movement, uh, 1963 is when the feminine mystique was published, uh, Betty Friedan, who really questioned what women's roles were and um, why women should be happy about being in the home um, and have their, um, their value uh, as wives or mothers rather than being in the workforce um, or club work uh, that was common for middle-class and upper-class women at the time. Uh, it is worth saying that the feminine mystique was pretty much only reviewed in the women's pages of newspapers. So in other words, um, 
this was about women reading the book rather than it being pushed out um, in many book sections, which were common at the time. 1968, um, with the protests at the Miss America pageant, this idea that again, women's appearances were the only thing that matters um, versus what they were actually doing. Uh, and the March for Equality uh, 1970, which is sometimes called the Strike for Equality. And the idea here, um, as we'll talk about marches coming up, was that women were taking on a public role, questioning what their role was in society. And this kind of laid a foundation um, for kind of what happened in Florida with the Equal Rights Amendment, because there was this um, awakening, if you will, or understanding about women's roles um, and the things that were standing in their way, as I mentioned, the inability to have a credit card or be able to rent an apartment. So media coverage as a journalism professor is based on news values. Um, and those kinds of things that make news are based on things that are kind of um, not the norm, if you will. So one of the examples with our journalism students, if traffic is going just fine, it's not a story. If there's a horrible accident or something happens that we get stuck in traffic, that becomes a story. So news values are based on some very specific ideas. And so one of the things um, that's important about looking at the ERA in Florida and Lori Wilson are the marches, the protest, and the speeches. And Part of this is because often the women who were involved and some men, um, th they had name value. And so they were gonna be covered for that part. Um, but the idea of protest marches, things that made good photos or good television also were significant. And that also helped me study uh, what had happened. So here, for example, um, is a photo of one of the marches. Um, in the center here, kind of um, where the, uh, the sign goes down, is uh, a woman by the name of Roxy Bolton. And she was quite significant um, in pushing the Equal Rights Amendment in Florida. Uh, she was also one of the first members of NOW, the National Organization for Women in Florida. Um, and she had several children. And so she pushed for the Equal Rights Amendment um, as a family issue. And as I'll explain to you today, um, the idea of family in the Equal Rights Amendment, um, both sides kind of tried to use that argument um, in different ways. But this idea of marching and going out in public and fighting for equal rights, it, it was really significant. Um, this was not a time where necessarily lots of women had been arguing for equal rights or looking for this. Now, of course, this does come out of the 1960s, right? Where we did have protests, um, the burning of draft cards. Um, you know, I mentioned to you earlier this, this 1968 Miss America pageant. Well, that's where the rumor about burning bras came from. No one ever burned a bra. You had to have a, a permit um, in New Jersey to be able to burn anything. And so that never actually happened. But those kind of myths, kind of led to this idea of the angry woman and the family woman. And that was a big part of what media coverage chose. Um, and again, this is not like an on purpose that someone sat around thinking about this, but in looking at the coverage, it was a big part of what media scholars call the cat fight. If two women or two groups of women are fighting with each other, uh, no one can decide what the answer is and they can kind of move on. Um, but the, these are the kinds of things that were happening throughout Florida about the Equal Rights Amendment and in other places uh, across the country. On the other hand, um, you had women that were definitely anti-ERA. And there was a lot of coverage, go back to my previous photo, of you know, these women who were very aggressive, if you will, very assertive. And then you had um, what kind of media coverage was the nice women. So these were women that were consistently um, wearing skirts at a time where wearing pants was considered um, a little bit outrageous in, in many, uh, many workforce um, and political arenas. And this idea that these women were fighting about, um, and again, this is the cat fight idea, right? That two women, two sets of women are fighting. This idea was that if you were for the ERA, you were against traditional roles for women. So um, 
if you said that you were pro ERA, you were anti-family. Um, another example, the idea of the ERA that this side um, would talk about was that there would be male um, Playboy bunnies and that women would be forced to uh, play football. So there was this kind of um, dynamic that was very female based um, about which side you were on. And again, this is in Florida. Uh, one of my favorite um, quotes came from a political think tank. Uh, make no mistake about it. Uh, Florida is crucial as Florida goes, so does uh, South Carolina. Um, and that would uh, prove for the momentum in Illinois. Uh, and of course, Florida never does pass it, but it is interesting I found in looking at this research that one, Florida was considered the deep South in some ways, because um, you know it, it's often been said, the further North you go in Florida, the further South you get. So Florida was complicated um, in that way. They were not, they didn't have the, um, the history that the deep South traditionally had about gender roles. Now, the passage in Illinois was mentioned um, because Phyllis Shafley was kind of the, um, the leader of the anti-ERA. And if you're interested in this topic at all, I highly recommend the Hulu series, Mrs. America, um, which largely puts Phyllis Shafley um, at the center of the anti-ERA. One of my favorite things about um, that show was that the women from Illinois, the uh, anti-ERA women, she was from Alton, Illinois, which is just over the border um, from Missouri, uh, just outside of St. Louis. So she um, and her colleagues drove up to Chicago and gave away bread under the theory that women should be in the home, in the kitchen making bread. And uh, many of the people got sick because the bread was so bad. Uh, so not everything worked out for Phyllis, even though in many ways she ultimately won. And I, and I should mention, um, Phyllis died recently on the last couple of years. And uh, since then, Illinois did pass the ERA uh, after her death. So here's a photo um, from the archives of the STOP ERA. And part of what happened, if you look at the images that were in the media at the time, is you had these very serious ERA women. And a lot of the images for pro-ERA, um, women in tie-dye, kind of um, out their hair. Uh, and so a lot of what happened was just simply putting reasonable, serious women against frivolous women um, in terms of the images of the time. And again, although this was Florida, it became a national issue because the theory was that if Florida went, so would South Carolina and some other Southern states. We um, have another parade, um, the National Organization for Women, who again, um, in the state of Florida was Roxy Bolton out of Miami. Um, and so there was, this was a very media happy image. Um, it made for good TV, for good newspaper. Um, you'll notice there in kind of the middle of that is a sign for Alan Alda. Um, who, if you don't know, was a very famous actor, um, MASH and other things back in the day, back when there was only so many shows you could watch at a given time before cable. And um, it was interesting in looking at the media coverage, how many celebrities came to Florida to talk about pro-ERA. Um, interestingly, there was a lot of people pro-ERA. It was really only Phyllis and a handful of her colleagues that ever came to Florida to, to kind of give the other side. And of course, that's always the challenge in media coverage, right? Is one side for, one side against, where they almost seem equal, even though um, there were polls and surveys and other things that showed that it was not one side or the other. Most um, folks were actually pro ERA. Uh, Phil Shafley came down to Miami to speak at one point in time. And um, one of these kind of scare tactics, if you will, was that if the ERA passed, then there would not be separate bathrooms, which of course we've seen in recent years talking about gay and trans rights. Um, this idea that um, you have to be scared of bathrooms. And uh, one, of, uh, one of the people that she debated against uh, asked Phyllis who had several children if she had separate bathrooms in her house 
based on gender for her kids. And uh, she was silenced in that moment. Um, as I mentioned, there were a lot of celebrities that came down. Um, and again, this caused media coverage. This is Marla Thomas, who of course was a famous TV personality in her day. Um, and she spoke out quite a bit about the ERA. She visited Florida several times. Um, and so there was lots of big turnout. Um, and again, we didn't see that on the other side. You don't see a lot of information having to do with um, celebrities that were anti-ERA. You had a few local folks, uh, and again, Phyllis, of course, but um, this discussion about what women's role should be um, was treated as if you know, it was one side versus the other, but it certainly didn't seem that way based on who came to speak, based on the debates, and based on surveys um, of the time. So there was, uh, as I mentioned, there was quite a bit of anti-ERA um, paperwork, propaganda, if you will, that existed at the time. So this headline here, you can't fool mother nature. That was a big part of the pushback from the conservative side um, against the Equal Rights Amendment. And this, again, this idea that women were gonna play football, men are gonna be playboy bunnies. Um, we won't know who's in charge of a family and who's doing this, that, or the other was pretty common. Um, and so several of these things um, on the slide, which came again from the anti-ERA group, uh, just weren't right. Um, so if you look here, ERA will hurt the family. The ERA will invalidate all state laws which require a husband to support his wife um, in a divorce. And that simply was not true. Um, another kind of common scare tactic was about the draft. If the ERA passes, then women will have to leave their families, leave their children and go fight abroad. And again, this is going back to the 1970s. Of course, none of that has ever happened, right, since then. But these scare tactics were repeated um, over and over again. Um, you'll notice here that the ERA will compel states to set up tax payer finance child care centers. Well, this was a time where there was a lot of news stories that if a, a woman worked outside of the home, her children um, would become criminals. I mean, this was in the newspaper and um, there were government sponsored studies that showed this. I found this um, especially interesting in, in listening to President Biden last night talk about funding for childcare, right? I mean, in some ways we've come so far in talking about the ERA in the 1970s till now, although again, we still don't have a past equal rights amendment in our country. Um, I, I also like this uh, quote from Senator Wilson. During a long history of struggle, um, when they're talking about conspiracy, there's going to be methods that inspire impatience. And that was a big thing that was a challenge for the pro-equal rights amendment women. This idea of marching, the idea of protesting, um, writing editorials, speaking to the press, were really considered that these women were very angry. Um, and they certainly weren't um, feminine, pro-family. Um, they didn't care about their country, you know, their place should be in the home, that sort of thing. And Lori really pushed hard um, across the state and in the national news to talk about this issue. And of course, as I mentioned, um, she was a divorced mother of two. She had struggles. Um, she eventually um, married the head of the Gannett company. Uh, Gannett is the newspaper chain that puts out USA Today, Florida Today, uh, many other newspapers. Um, and so even after she was out of office, she spent a lot of time talking about women's roles. She actually spoke to executives in her husband's company to encourage the hiring of women at a time when it didn't happen. Um, I think it's worth mentioning in terms of media coverage, how few women were in decision-making media posts at the time. Um, after a series of um, lawsuits, women were finally hired in bigger numbers um, at newspapers, TV stations, radio stations, not until the 1970s. So when you have these women like Lori talking to reporters, they probably weren't talking to women. Um, and if they did, that news stayed in the women's section. So it's not something that men would have read about. Um, because the women's pages was, of course, considered things that would only pertain um, 
to women. Uh, but Lori really pushed hard. Um, when I look back at her speeches, um, which I was able to find um, at the archives, she, she made excellent points and really pushed hard. And again, was kind of a very media savvy kind of lady um, in her own right and because of her marriage. And so she did really have a significant position throughout the 1970s. Uh, it's worth mentioning that several men were also helpful for the Equal Rights Amendment, not in the same numbers of, as women, um, but Roxy Bolton's husband uh, started a, a group for men who wanted to push for the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, and so there were some men that you would find, but more often than not, it was treated as this cat fight concept. These women can't get along. They can't decide what they want. Um, lots of media stories where um, the reporter would find a woman that was like, I don't want equal rights. And that kind of became the lead. Um, but there were lots of um, protests that did involve at least a few men uh, in looking at the photos. So the, again, this, um, oops. This did get um, media coverage uh, across the country. This picture right here shows Lori Wilson crying after the ERA doesn't pass. And this photo is used so often that it just seems so gendered. Um, this idea of the crying woman, right? Who doesn't get what she wanted, um, who fought so hard uh, and didn't get the votes to go her way. Um, and just kind of looking back at um, broadcast coverage. So the ABC News had less than a minute of coverage about the Florida ERA. CBS did 3.5 minutes. Uh, NBC did five minutes and did include Wilson. Um, and one of the histories of the ERA in Florida, it was noted that when the TV cameras would come in, um, they would focus on Lori. And every time that she would speak, you would hear this background noise of all the cameras um, because this idea that she was um, so camera perfect for making an argument in the same way that Gloria Steinem um, often gets credit for being feminine and being the person that could kind of lead the fight that um, she wasn't a man hater or negative in that way. Um, so some, oh, sorry, uh, some further material and, and I will, um, send this on to the library. Uh, I wrote about the Florida fight for equality in the Florida Historical Quarterly um, with lots of the photos um, that we showed today and that I, I've spoken about um, where I kind of took apart what the mediated argument was. Because so much I think of what these women were fighting for um, has kind of um, gone away now. Like I, I, it would be interesting to have a, a a nice debate about the Equal Rights Amendment today. And it does happen periodically in the Florida legislature. Um, but this idea that, you know, bathrooms and um, alimony and the draft, like all of these things have kind of been accomplished, but yet there's still a place for having an amendment to our constitution that give women equal rights. Um, the late, Ruth Bader Ginsburg often gave talks that said that we are the only um, country in the modern world that doesn't have something like that in our constitution. Um, and I figured if she thinks so, I do too. Uh, I also spoke about Senator Lori Wilson in the ERA for Florida Frontiers, which is a radio show from the um, Florida Historical Society. Uh, and I'll be forwarding that on too, um, to be able to um, share a little bit more about Lori. Uh, I will conclude before questions um, a little bit more about Lori Wilson. So Lori Wilson um, left um, state government in the 1970s. Um, she ended up um, divorcing the Gannett exec, Al Neuwirth, um, after that. She went on to get a law degree, um, but she didn't really have a very public role. I, I was thinking about her a few years ago um, in 2019 in search to see kind of what had happened to her. She died in 2019. Um, there was no funeral. This was of course pre-COVID. Um, there was no funeral. There was no real recogni recognition of her. And I think in Women's History Month, it's incredibly important to talk about these women that don't get recognition, don't get discussion, don't, kind of have their place. Yes, she's got 
a very nice park, but I don't know if people really understand how significant um, Senator Wilson is. So I'm uh, open for some questions or I can keep talking, but I thought I'd stop and ask for some questions. Richards added a comment about a book we've got as part of the new book display called Looking for America, or sorry, Looking for Miss America, a pageant's 100 year quest to define womanhood. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, and it's in the new white wavy shelves by the student union entrance. Awesome. And I had a couple of thoughts for um, with the draft because that has come up recently. I've seen in the news where mm -hmm. people say, no, we have to start adding women to the draft. And I do wonder about it as being an out of date concept because we've had an all volunteer army for almost 40 years now. So why do we still have the draft in place? Warfare has changed tremendously <laughs> exactly. since the Vietnam era. So, but it seems to still be used as like a scare tactic. Right, exactly. Um, so when I looked at kind of like the seven reasons for the, you know why the ERA shouldn't pass, none of them really hold up today. And of course, the other part, I think of talking about the military and talking about the draft just overall as a concept, that was used against women in the military who wanted to go into combat. Mm -hmm. So the whole idea was, the women who did want, you know, not the draft necessarily, but women in the military that wanted to go into combat, um, the anti-ERA arguments were used against them to prevent them from doing the thing that they wanted to do, right? Or raise, you know, having that experience um, to get promoted, to raise through the ranks, you know, that that sort of thing. It is um, almost jarring to see how those scare tactics have been eliminated, but yet having the ERA has not happened. Um, in fact, some states have tried to rescind their positive ERA votes. Oh, wow. Yeah, so it's kind of creepy. Um, so, you know, after these, these positive votes um, in the 1970s, some state legislatures have tried to rescind that, um, but I believe every governor has said no. So even though they're trying, but again, um, I think if you have Supreme Court justice saying we need it, saying that the 14th Amendment does not protect women for equal issues. I, I, I do think it's something that's worth discussing. Um, I've been in Florida now for more than 12 years and it's come up almost every year still in our legislature. Um, it's also worth mentioning that of course, we didn't pass women's right to vote either until we symbolically did it in, 19, in the late 1960s. So, you know, it, it, we have a complicated, relationship with gender and power and legislation um, in our state. But this this push keeps happening. You know, it, it's not an old story. I've seen it pop up multiple times. Uh, Richard just commented sharing information on another book about opposing dress codes in the ERA fight. Uh, it's called Dressing for the Culture Wars, Style and the Politics of Self-Presentation in the 1960s and 70s, and it's an ebook available at UCF Libraries. Oh my goodness, I've never heard of that, but I'm gonna be looking it up after this, I'll tell you for sure. Um, and, and that's one of the things I teach in my journalism history class. Um, one of the women I study, um, she, had, she was the publisher, which is pretty much the top job you can get. And one of the first women in the country, one of the first things she did when she got that position was change the editorial policy at her newspaper to be pro ERA and allow women to wear pants. That was in the mid eighties. There was a rule that the women at the newspaper could not wear pants. Um, so these things that, um, you know, sometimes I think it, it, it feels old because, you know, particularly now because we go to the store in our sweatpants or <laughs> pajama pants or whatever, um, or we barely get dressed up. But these are things that are not that long ago. Um, and it was almost always women that fought for themselves as well as others for these reasons. I mean, the ability to wear what you wanted to do, particularly when you're a reporter and you might be chasing down a source, um, the idea that you might be in a very physically um, challenging environment and you weren't allowed to wear pants, it, it, it seems jarring, but that was the mid eighties. And I've still seen that pop up today. I've seen people in administrative positions broken a toe, still standing there in four inch stilettos because <laughs> it's expected that they're in a suit and high heels. 
um, women still face a lot of judgment about if they're not wearing makeup, oh, right. they're sick or they're not putting any effort out and it affects promotion. Yes. Well, and, 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 you know, that was a big thing that these women were fighting. Um, as I mentioned, the burning bras concept was actually what was called a freedom can in 1968, the Miss America pageant. And what they were tossing in there was mascara and curling irons. But the whole purpose of what they were trying to say, even though it got reduced to burning a bra, the whole concept overall is why women had to go through that when men didn't. Mm -hmm. And what happens to you if you reject a very traditional feminine concept um, I sometimes look at what these women wrote and just think they were decades ahead of their time. Um, we can still talk about it today, um, but many of them, you know, were criticized, um, had difficult lives because of what they said, um, or never kind of got mainstream acceptance because they were pushing against the status quo. Peggy McDonald mentioned uh, the catfight concept is powerful. This reminds me of the Mommy Wars media features in recent, recent years. And she thanks you for having a fantastic, fascinating discussion as always. <laughs> Peggy's awesome. Um, but you know, this, this has been a, it seems simplistic, but it's very powerful. If two sets of women are fighting, it allowed, and again, this was all men in the news media. So um, this was back, you know, all, we only had three networks to watch the evening news to get national news. It's these three white men. Um, and their basic premise in, in watching all the media clips was, well, if the women don't know what they want, what can we do about it? So focusing on the fight meant, let's not look at the issues. It was about the conflict, if you will. If we focus on the conflict, we don't have to talk about things like, you know, um, it's not really true that women wouldn't get alimony if they got divorced. Um, and, and frankly, at that time, lots of men just left the family and the women had to work anyway. So it wasn't always, a, you know, even that simplistic. Um, what, you know, women would do in the military, um, bathrooms, um, equal pay, all of those kinds of things that were important were often not discussed as long as the media coverage was about women fighting. And I know there are definitely examples you can find with other things like the Black Lives Matter movement and how it's covered in media that they follow similar patterns in coverage. Exactly. I mean, the number of times since I originally wrote, um, studied this concept, and wrote about it, um, you see consistently. And the challenge is, of course, how do we get beyond just um, the conflict, the, the march, the protest? Because yes, that is the easiest thing to coverage as a journalist, right? I can cover that easily. I can point my camera, I can take pictures, but why are those marches and protests happening? That's the harder part. And it's, it's, it's especially difficult, I think, for television reporters when you're trying to do a story in 60 or 90 seconds. <laughs> How do you get to the, you know what I mean? The, the details of that. Um, but when we don't do that, we see the same concepts repeat. Um, and talking about um, the protests and the marches for Black Lives Matter, you could easily use some of the same concepts uh, that happened in Florida for the ERA back in the 1970s. Great. Uh, does anybody else have any other questions or comments they'd like to add? You can also raise your hand and I'll have you um, unmute yourself. Uh, at the moment, I'm not seeing anything else. Uh, do you know of any other works, if somebody wants to read more on Lori Wilson, where we might be able to find that? Um, other than the stuff that I've kind of worked on, um, she does have an official biography with the Florida um, Senate, Senate office. Um, but as I mentioned, the hard part was, is that she kind of disappears um, by the 1980s. And so she didn't even get a funeral, even though she was so significant. Um, so I will continue writing about her. Um, I think that if, Folks keep an eye out for the Equal Rights Amendment in Florida. It will continue to be an issue. Um, uh, oh, I will also say one more thing. If you've been to Jetty Park, uh, Lori Wilson was the one that fought for the funding for Jetty Park over um, in the Cocoa area. So whether it's the Equal Rights Amendment, um, what she did for uh, Florida parks and recreation, um, she was this person um, that really made a difference that I think it's forgotten. And Richard added, uh, it's dangerous to draw historical parallels, but are there similar similarities with the fight for the ERA and the passage of the 19th Amendment? Um, 
in some ways it was much more hostile for the 19th Amendment, um, women getting the right to vote. Um, and I think it's worth mentioning, um, it took 75 years for women to get the right to vote. I mean, that's a long, long time. Um, and so I teach a journalism history class at UCF and we look back at how the women who fought for the right to vote were portrayed. Um, they were often portrayed as being ugly and angry and hating men. I mean, there's a certain <laughs> parallel there. It was worse than by far. Um, but considering that the Equal Rights Amendment first came in front of Congress in 1923, it took a long time. And of course, we don't even have it yet. Um, you know, we're coming up really um, on 100 years of trying to get the Equal Rights Amendment passed. So it's actually longer than it took women to get the right to vote, but the parallels are often there. I do think that the arguments from the 1970s don't hold water today. And so I hope that we get some more um, media coverage that explores the complexity because you know a lot of the arguments back then just don't hold water today. And if, as I said, um, if we have people like Scalia um, and Ruth Bader Ginsburg on opposite ends of um, the political spectrum, both agreeing that the 14th Amendment doesn't give women equal rights, I think it's worth um, having that debate again. Shelly Hall uh, thanks you for the presentation. And she said she really enjoyed your passion and information on the topic. Thank you. You were mentioning like with some of the old 70s arguments, I noticed the one at the very bottom was it would allow, and it was in quotes, homosexuals to get married and adopt <laughs> children. Like, yeah. yeah, we're already good there. That's yeah. It, it, well, yeah. And most states. <laughs> right. I don't mean children is an issue right. in some states. Adoption, right, unfortunately. Um, but the Supreme Court agreed, right, with what these women were trying to do. And, and again, that's to me, that's another example of how ahead of their times these women were. And by even saying that, you know, it was a lot of pushback. Uh, it was very angry at them. And so much of what people were afraid of, um, again, we've lived through things and been just fine. <laughs> so it seems that if those are the reasons not to do it, I'd like to know the reasons today that this isn't being passed. Mm -hmm. uh, and if all these other progressive, modern um, countries, it's part of their constitution, it's hard for me to imagine why it's not in ours. Mm -hmm. uh, I noticed Richard's unmuted. Richard, did you want to uh, add anything? Uh, no, I just wanted to thank Lori, uh, Kimberly for <laughs> Uh, I've been dealing with a lot of lorries lately. Kim, <laughs> thank, thank you so much. Uh, this has been fascinating. Uh, and uh, I'm, uh, I didn't catch the episode from Florida Frontiers, so I will look it up in, online and listen to that segment. Well, thank you. And thank you for having me. I love talking about Florida women. So this, is, uh, this means a lot to me, too. And uh, the material you've added, I'll include um, as links within um, the STARS page for this once the video is uploaded. And then also on the YouTube channel. For the YouTube channel, there will be closed captions available. And for STARS, we're going to have open captions burned into the video because closed captions isn't an option for us as part of that system. Awesome. And like I said, once uh, we get off here, I will email you links to those two so you have them. And for anybody interested, we have all of Kim's books that are in print at the UCF libraries. They are part of the UCF author collection. So I think there's some on display up on the new fourth floor reading room. And I think a couple are still in the arc. Well, thank so. you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you for joining us. We love having you come in to do talks and we hope we can have a bunch more in the future. Sounds great. Happy Women's History Month. Happy Women's History Month, everyone. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Take care.